Good morning, everybody. We talked about the waters on the last video, but I want to back up and, and uh, since it's the only thing that's new for this, uh, for the facial bones lecture, I want to uh, talk about it again. So positioning of the waters, uh, what you can do is you can start as if you're shooting a call well, put the patient's you know, face up against the image receptor, but then extend the chin back again until the um, the orbital meatal line forms a 37 degree angle with the plane of the film, and that's or the image receptor. That's going to put just the chin on the image receptor. Now, in the, the PowerPoints, uh, it doesn't mention the 55 waters, but in a lot of the hospitals I've worked in, facial bone series, because of the possible for orbital fractures, and especially since this test is over facial bones and orbits, uh, you need to look over the 55 waters as well. So again, the 37 waters extends the chin back far enough that the petrous ridges drop below the maxillary sinuses so that we can see evidence of a blowout fracture. But at the same time, we can, we can diagnose a tripod fracture, we can diagnose uh, fractures of the, the uh, zygomatic arch as well. Uh, and we can see the sinuses too, um, the frontal sinus and the maxillary sinuses. So we'll, we'll look at this again when we go through sinuses. So uh, 37 waters, drops the petrous ridges below the maxillary sinuses um, so that you can see evidence of the blowout fracture. 55 waters puts the floor of the orbit uh, perpendicular to the uh, image receptor and parallel to the, the plane of the, the uh, central ray so that we can maybe diagnose the fracture itself. Uh, probably not, but possibly. Uh, the 55 waters involves just bringing the chin up or the, the, the head up, the, the chin down a little bit, um, to the point where for most people, if the, the chin and the nose is on the image receptor, you're sitting at a 55 waters. So 37, chin only, um, 55, chin and nose, um, and make sure that you don't have rotation on either one of those two. <clears throat> so uh, don't, don't overlook the, the 55. So that's 37, and if you look in your textbook, on page, it's actually called modified waters. On page 67 and 68, you you start you, you see the difference between 37 and 55 waters. Um, the the orbits get a significantly larger, and because of the angulation, if if I tilt this thing back, you can kind of see what's going on here. Uh, pointing out the elephant on the last video uh, that you should be able to see uh, if you can make them out, but if if your chin is tucked, then the trunk um, is superimposed on itself and you just don't see it. As you bring the chin back, you start to see the zygomatic arches. So on the 55 waters, you're not gonna make those diagnoses. Uh, about the only thing that you can see is the, the nasal septum, which you're also gonna see on the 37, um, and the, the orbit itself, but you're not gonna be able to make a diagnosis of the zygomatic arch. You probably be able to make a diagnosis of tripod fracture, but it's just not as complete as what a uh, 37 waters is. So um, the, the reverse waters is just AP, put the, um, the uh, mental meataline perpendicular to the image receptor. If you can't do that, then you're gonna put the central ray parallel to the uh, mental meataline. So that's what you're getting there. So the call well, again, is just the same call well that we saw before. So uh, either with the patient prone or with the patient upright, it doesn't really matter which way we go with it, but we're gonna put the patient's forehead and nose on the image receptor, and we're gonna angle the central ray 15 degrees uh, caudally, just like the waters, or the, the call well that we saw before. Unless you're wanting to see more of the orbit, uh, superior orbital fissures, uh, the um, orbital rims, and now you're gonna have a, what some people will call an exaggerated call well, and that would be a 30 degree angulation as, as opposed to the 15 degrees. Um, so uh, radiation field, one and a half inches beyond central ray exits at the nasion. Um, and your evaluation is just like the evaluation that we saw before. You're going to look at rotation. Rotation, granted this is AP versus PA, but um, the, uh, the rotation is going to be 
the, the lateral side of the orbit compared to the lateral, lateral side of the skull. So if the PA uh, side closest to the image receptor, you're gonna have more skull lateral to the orbit. On the elevated side, the, the orbit's gonna be right at the, uh, possibly even beyond the, the border of the skull. So um, if, if you're shooting the patient upright, you know, uh, I recommend you put on gloves and put your, your hands, just like we talked about in skulls themselves, put your hands on either side of the patient, thumbs behind the ears, and adjust rotation that way. If the patient's uh, laying down on the table, get at the end of the table and look at the top of the skull. It's hard to, to detect rotation if you're standing off to the side of the patient, so make sure you get to the end of the, the table so that you can see the, the top of the patient's skull. If you're looking down on them like this, uh, you can have slight rotation and not really be aware of it. So call well looks like that. Again, just like the, the call well we saw before, the petrous ridges are in the lower third of the orbits. Um, frontal sinuses, again, we're going to look at a variation of call well for frontal sinuses whenever we do sinuses. But uh, the orbit, petrous ridges in the lower third, make sure we don't have any kind of rotation going on anything like that. So um, again, some of the more common fractures of the, the uh, skull would be of the zygomatic arches, and that's what we're looking at right there. And there's a couple of different ways to visualize the zygomatic arches. Um, I can't really demonstrate the, the towns uh, with central ray angulation and all that in here, but uh, the, the more common way to shoot the zygomatic arches is to, to use a shooter's, uh, the same SMV that we saw before, and I'm kind of going out of order for a purpose here. Uh, the problem is, like what you're seeing on, on this guy here, is that SMV uh, does not show the zygomatic arches. Um, and really this has more to do with the distance that we've got going on here, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but uh, it's, it can be very difficult if, if a patient has a big head, like mine, um, it can be very difficult to see the, the zygomatic arches. So what we can do is uh, shoot towns in order to, to visualize them. So we've got uh, SMV, we've got a tangential, and we've got a towns uh, that, that we'll shoot for zygomatic arches. So uh, the same things apply here as, as what applied in skull. You know, if, if you've got a patient who, uh, you know, they got a broken zygoma, a zygomatic arch, and you, you put them into an SMV uh, position with patient upright, um, they're just not gonna be able to maintain that position. They're unstable, they're probably gonna fall down and now you're gonna to have to shoot skull series two, probably a CT, you look at lawsuits, uh, just not a good thing. So if you're going to shoot SMVs uh, at the vertical bucky, make sure that you put them in a chair, not on a rolling stool because a rolling stool is no better to stand the patient up, but uh, put them in a chair with a back so that if, you know, if they get kind of woozy, um, and even if they faint, they're not gonna likely fall out of the chair. So chair with a back, definitely chair with arms, even better still to make sure that they don't fall out. So your positioning is gonna be identical uh, to what it was before. You're gonna hyperextend the neck until the infraorbital medial line, the IOML, is parallel to the image receptor. Um, if you're shooting on a table, you're gonna have a difficult time getting the patient into that position. I mean, that's, that's really cranking the neck back a, a quite a bit in order to get the, the OML parallel to the table. Uh, and so it will be parallel to the, to the image receptor. So um, what you may have to do if, if you don't put the patient, if you're not shooting at the, the vertical bucky, is you may have to build the patient up in order to, to get their, the top of their head back that far. Even still, I mean, it, it's frame and magnum, so the, the uh, C-spine will be at a very acute angle, um, and the patient still might not be able to do that, even if you build them up. So if you can't get the OML parallel to the image receptor, you definitely need to get the central ray perpendicular to the, I just said OML, IOML. Uh, you definitely need to get the central ray perpendicular to the IOML, all right? So um, upright or or uh, supine, 
it doesn't really matter except for patient safety issues. Uh, get the chin back so that the IOML is parallel to the image receptor, and if you can't do that, get the central ray perpendicular to the IOML. So uh, the, really the, the only difference uh, between the SMV for zygomatic arches and the SMV for uh, the skull or even the sinuses, we'll look at it again. Um, in uh, whenever we cover sinuses, is central ray location collimation, but there is one variation that you can use. Um, because of the divergence of the central ray and what we're dealing with in here, that would be probably a, a two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 foot uh, SID, probably. Uh, I can't really demonstrate this all that well. I'll try to back it up closer to the data projector and see if I can demonstrate it. But um, because of, of the divergence of the central ray, if you've got a patient who's got a big head, especially if they've got a small face and a big head, one thing that you can do is take the patient or take the, the, uh, the uh, x-ray tube and move it closer to the patient. What that does is it takes the divergence of the central ray, which 12 feet uh, is, is pretty narrow, and it broadens the, um, the uh, divergence. So that it, instead of shooting at 40 inches, if you back it down to maybe 30 inches, um, then your divergence becomes more significant. So that anything that's further away from the image receptor is gonna be more magnified. You know, how that applies here is the zygomatic arches are further away from the image receptor than the vertex of the skull and the widest portion of the skull. So by reducing your OI or your SID, what you're doing is taking advantage of magnification and divergence of the central ray to project the zygomatic arches out and away from the skull itself. So if, uh, if you shoot a um, SMV for zygomatic arches and you just can't see them and you have no rotation, could be that you've got rotation because as, as you rotate, tilt the patient's head, what you're seeing there on one side is zygomatic arch, uh, but as I, I tilt in one direction, zygomatic arch disappears and the other zygomatic arch appears. So um, if you don't have any kind of head tilt, then, then what you may be dealing with is a patient with a big head. Um, so reduce your OID or uh, SID, uh, take advantage of the magnification and you might be able to see it. So um, do you lose SRD? Well, yeah, but what you look for is a fracture um, and uh, the fracture should be pretty obvious. Uh, you know, if, if it breaks, it's gonna crush inward and it's, you're, you're gonna have an obvious deformity there. So uh, sharpness recorded detail is important but making the, the diagnosis is more so. If you can't see the, the anatomy at all, you can't make the diagnosis. If you can see the anatomy, even if you lose a little bit of sharpness or recorded detail, then at least you can make the diagnosis. All right, so collimation, again, the, the, uh, the difference here between SMV for skull and SMV for zygomatic arches is central ray location collimation. All you need to see is the front half of the skull. So you don't need to, to include, you know, uh, the, the occipital bone or anything further back than that. So collimation, just need to see the, the arches. You can even do these tabletop and it makes it a whole lot easier if the patient's laying on the table. Um, you can have the patient hold the uh, image receptor directly over the top of their head, uh, angle it until it's parallel to the zygomatic arches. You don't really need to build the patient up all that much. Uh, just have them crank the, the chin back, put the, the, um, the uh, image receptor parallel to the IOML, central ray perpendicular to the IOML, and you shouldn't take the top. So the central ray enters, uh, mid sagittal plane of the throat one inches posterior to the outer canthus. So you've got to, you know, use a little bit of, of uh, uh, you know, you got you to gotta look a little bit, it's kind of a strange orientation, but uh, outer canthus will be the outer portion of the eye. 
So central ray would be right down here. So posterior portion, just anterior maybe of the uh, EAM, might be a little bit easier for you to focus on than uh, trying to figure out the outer canthus and, and draw a parallel there. All right, so what you should see is that. So what we've got is zygomatic arches on both sides. Uh, that's uh, just almost picture perfect. This guy's got a, a depressed fracture. You can see the, uh, the remnant there of the uh, zygomatic process of the temporal bone here. And then you've got two fractures, which is usually the case. Uh, it's gonna be awfully tough to have a depressed fracture in a single fracture. So um, that's what we're looking for. So uh, if, you, if you've, again, got a patient that you, you tried the reduction in SID, didn't work, um, and you tried the, the SMB regular, didn't work, still can't see it, then what you can do is a tangential. Terminology, again, tangential just means skimming the surface. So what we're gonna do on a tangential collimation even gets more significant. We're gonna take the patient and the, the, the wording in the textbook, I'm gonna stop the video and, and uh, pick this up on the next, next video, but uh, the uh, wording in the textbook is a little bit confusing and I'll get there in just a second. 